our services here this morning. If you're visiting with us, you are especially welcome. We hope you will come back any opportunity that you can. If you are visiting, if you would fill out one of the visitor cards and place it in the collection basket when it goes by, we would greatly appreciate that. This morning, Tim Wells will be our song leader. Harry Ogletree will lead our minds in an opening, opening prayer. Perry Varnado will have our scripture reading. Tom Eddy and Earl Schramm will preside over the table. And Roger Rush will bring us our message this morning. And at this time, we're going to begin with a song. Number 531, 531. <clears throat> When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning, when the dead in Christ shall rise, and the glory of his resurrection share, when his chosen one shall gather to the home beyond the skies, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, when the roll Before the master from the dawn to setting sun, let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then, when all of life is over and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder. When the roll is called up yonder, the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. To prepare our minds for Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 170, number 170. We'll sing the chorus after verses 2 and 4 only. <clears throat> They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets in shame. They spat upon the Savior so pure and free from sin. Said crucify him, he's to blame. Upon his precious head they placed a crown of thorns. They laughed and said, Behold the king. Oh, 
angels destroy the world and set him free. Could have called ten thousand angels, but he died alone for you and me. When they nailed him to the cross, his mother stood nearby. He said, Woman, behold thy son. He cried, I thirst for water, but they gave him none to drink. Then the sinful work of man was done. To the howling mob he yielded, he did not for mercy cry. The cross of shame he took alone, and when he cried his finish, <clears throat> gave himself to die, salvation's wondrous plan was done. He could have called ten thousand angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called ten thousand angels, but he died alone for you and me. Lest we forget, we would gather on the first day of the week to get around this memorial in, in memory of the crucifixion. Christ died on that cross for all mankind that they give them hope of life eternal. As we partake of this this morning, we have the bread that represents his broken body and the fruit of the vine which represents the blood he shed on the cross. Let us give thanks for the bread. Our Father, we thank thee for this another first day of the week. Thank you for the privilege we have of coming to worship thee. Thank you that Jesus died on the cross for us and this way you bless this bread that represents his broken body. Bless each one that partakes of it. For in Christ's name we pray and amen.
Let's continue our thanks. Dear God in heaven, we once again thank you for another opportunity you've given us to surround this table. We ask you bless this fruit of vine that represents the blood that Christ shed upon that cross. We ask you bless those that partake of it, that we do this in a manner that's pleasing to you. This we ask in just your name. Amen. If we've missed anyone, would you hold up your hand? At this time, we have another responsibility to give back to the Lord a portion of that which he's blessed us with. Let us pray. Our Father, we're so thankful that we live in a country that we prosper as we do. We pray, Father, we have purpose in our heart that which will return to you for the work of the church may be used in accordance to your will. In Christ's name we pray, and amen. Next song will not be available on the overhead, so please grab a book and turn to number 396. 396. Oh, how sweet will be to meet the Lord when he comes in glory by and by. What a song of praise will be outpoured when he comes in glory by and by. How sweet, how sweet when he comes in the sky. What joy, what joy when he comes in glory by and by. We will have our 
white as snow when he comes in glory by and by. Oh, be ready with the Lord to go when he comes in glory by and by. How sweet, how sweet when he comes in the sky. What joy, what joy when he comes in glory by and by. I am longing for that happy day when he comes in glory by and by. For with him I hope to soar away when he comes in glory by and by. How sweet, how sweet when he comes in the sky. What joy, what joy when he comes in glory by and by. The song before the lesson will be number 567, 567. If you're able to, please stand. <clears throat> There's a great day coming, a great day coming, there's a great day coming by and by. When the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left, are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? There's a bright day coming, a bright day coming, there's a bright day coming by and by. But its brightness shall only come to them that love the Lord. Are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? There's a sad day coming, a sad day coming, there's a sad day coming by and by. When the sinner shall be resumed, depart, I know ye not. Are you ready for that day to come? Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? So I'm finding the lesson will be number 602. 602. Will you pray with me, please? Dear God and Father in heaven, we are, we are grateful and thankful that we get to worship you this morning. We can only imagine how the chorus across the whole world must sound as your people praise and sing to you and encourage and edify one another and hopefully draw those near who don't know you. We thank you, Father, for your word that truly reveals your will to us. Our prayer and hope is that you will help us to, uh, to understand it uh, when we study it and to uh, understand in its proper context, to understand it and how it applies to our individual lives and help us, Father, in uh, being courageous and yet skillful and kind as we share it with those around us. We know, Father, that when we meet that uh, we come uh, with uh, different hearts and different thoughts and different ideas and pray that you would comfort and lift up the heavy heart this morning and help us all to join in for this joyous occasion in worshiping you and being revived in our beings as we truly come together in a peaceful state and a joyful state to uh, serve you, the almighty, true, living God. 
pray a special blessing on our friends and family day that's upcoming, uh, that you will help us to um, display uh, a little bit of courage and as we talk to our friends and family and acquaintances about coming and uh, at least give them the opportunity to come, Father, and help us to be prepared to greet them and to make them feel comfortable uh, when that happens. But most of all, we're grateful and thankful for today. We're thankful for this very hour, and we're thankful for this time that we all get to be right here and to worship you uh, in spirit and in truth and to uh, truly try to glorify our Lord on earth as he glorified you. Uh, may you help each of us uh, in the individual challenges that we face. Uh, you May you help us, Lord, in how we uh, love one another. And uh, most of all, Father, help us to love you more. Uh, we pray a special blessing for those in uh, further west, uh, Missouri and Arkansas, who are um, facing uh, extreme challenges uh, with uh, flooding. Uh, comfort the families who've lost loved ones. And may the church be um, of, of a good source for those there and whom they can help. And um, I pray that the waters will... Uh, will stop coming and that the people will um, be able to begin to restore their lives and what will be a long trek to some type of normalcy. May your grace and mercy exceed there. We just praise you and thank you, Father, for this time. We thank you for each one present, uh, from the youngest to the oldest. And may we all, as your people, uh, truly worship you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture this morning is from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 31. Hebrews 10, 26 through 31. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment, do you suppose, will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Harry mentioned the floods out west a moment ago in his prayer. I talked to Dave Casto this past week. He and Kathy had gone to the warehouse in Nashville, National Disaster Relief for Churches of Christ. And in a little more than two hours, they and others prepared 500 boxes of food and cleaning supplies and loaded them on the semi to be shipped out to uh, those in need. And he wanted you to know what a tremendous work that was and uh, how efficiently it was done. Uh, we've been supporting that work for a number of years now, and it is a tremendously effective way to help those in need. And I wanted you to know that Dave and Kathy had volunteered, and they, of course, we're not wanting me to make mention of this, but they're not here to know about it. Uh, but uh, very impressed with the way that was done. I was thinking of Acts 9 a moment ago. You probably remember Acts 9 because it's there that we have the story of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus recorded for the first time. But it's also in Acts 9 that we learn about Dorcas. Dorcas died, and uh, the brethren summoned Peter, and when he arrived, uh, many began to show him uh, some of the fruits of her labors. Uh, she was extremely talented, very energetic and generous, and gave a great deal to the saints, uh, and they were deeply moved by her passing. And it reminded me of something that one of our own recently did, and I wanted to mention it to you. Uh, she probably wouldn't want me to do it in this way either, but uh, Bethany Brown has been very active in raising funds for Alzheimer's uh, for some time now, uh, a disease that's uh, dear to my own heart. I lost my mother from Alzheimer's at the age of 80. And she's put together a cookbook 
lots of recipes. Many of them I can attest firsthand to be quite good. Uh, many of our ladies have submitted those recipes. And uh, these things are selling for $10. Or if you want mine, since I've owned it briefly, you can have it for 25 <laughs> And I will give that money to Bethany, too. But if you'd like to have one of those cookbooks, please see her. I can't think of a more worthy cause for you to uh, support uh, than that. Now, one other quick announcement before we begin our study. You know that next Sunday is our friends, family, and neighbors day. You also know that it's Mother's Day. There's a reason why we've scheduled this for next Sunday. It's the only time we could get Harold and Sally Shank. It was the only weekend they had free uh, through the end of May. And when Harold gave me those dates, uh, we ran with them uh, because the couple we originally had scheduled to be with us this spring uh, had to back out uh, earlier this year due to health reasons. Glenn and Hope Hawkins had uh, planned to be with us. Uh, Glenn is doing better following some uh, heart issues. Hope is still not uh, able to really be very active, so keep them in your prayers. I know because it is Mother's Day next week that some of you may have plans for lunch if you do. Uh, please understand that we understand. But if you don't, or if you're cheap like me, what better way than to uh, feed your mother or your wife than at a potluck where she'll do a lot of cooking and preparation, and I do nothing, nor does it cost me anything. Uh, plan to be here if you can. Please encourage uh, others to come with you. We've heard Harold on other occasions, and he always does an excellent job. I'm confident uh, that will be true of Sally for our ladies this coming Saturday, and just as confident that it will be true for Harold uh, at the 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, and 1.30 hours. Now, I want you to pay really careful attention now. I'm going to say this one more time. There will be no 6.30 service next Sunday evening. We will have a 1.30 service in lieu of the 6.30 service. So please don't tell me in two weeks, I didn't know we weren't meeting that night. Well, if you don't know, ain't my problem now, because you should surely have figured it out. And I hope that you'll be able to be here for all three of those services and, if possible, enjoy lunch with us as well. And I know there's still a sign-up sheet out on the board in the foyer for lunch, and also, I believe, still a sign-up sheet regarding the ladies' tea for Saturday at 2. Those are the announcements I wanted to share with you this morning, and now we turn our attention to today's study. The text that Perry read a moment ago from Hebrews 10 ought to send chills up and down your spine if you are not a child of God. The passage tells us when we reject Jesus, there is no other sacrifice for sin. What there is is a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. Apart from our Lord, there is no hope for us. There is nothing beyond this realm but the fires of eternal torment. And I realize as I say that in our modern or postmodern secular society that that really doesn't register. You see, many, many people among us today have already written off God. They have denied the deity of Christ. They have rejected the validity of the Bible. And they don't believe as we do, that there is something beyond this realm. Which leads me to ask from the biblical perspective, what is our ultimate fate? We know that it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. 
We've read the historical narrative of Genesis together many times. And in chapter 5, over seven times, the statement is made, and he died. The only exception in that genealogy was Enoch, who walked with God, and God took him, and he was not. Everyone else faced death in Genesis. Surely none of us would think that we will escape. So it's a fair question to ask. What lies on the other side? What is our ultimate fate? Now, there are many people in our world that believe in reincarnation. They believe that life is just a vicious cycle of living and dying, being reborn to do it all over again, until if you're really fortunate, you get it right, and you ultimately become a god. And this reincarnation is based on how you do in this life relative to how you will do in the preceding life. If you happen to mess up royally now, you might come back as a lizard, a dog, or even a cat. If you do better, you might come back better, but it's just this endless, vicious cycle. And there is a large segment of the world's population that believes in this. There are others who say when you're dead, it's over. Life ends, you are annihilated. Boy, that offers nothing. For a people ingrained with the idea that we matter and that there is something beyond this realm that's better, this doctrine offers nothing. And yet there are folks who believe it entirely. If an atheist or agnostic were among us today, and I don't know that they're not, their belief is in death. You're annihilated. You just simply cease to be. It is though you have never been, and you will never be again. There's the doctrine of universalism, which some, even in the evangelical movement today, are espousing that says, when life ends and eternity begins, everybody is okay. The emphasis is placed on the love of God. Again, John 3, 16 will be cited. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And the conclusion is, if God is a loving God, he could not allow anyone to be lost. I will readily grant to you that God's desire is the salvation of humanity. He wants all men to come unto a knowledge of the truth and be saved. This came from the pen of the Apostle Paul to the young preacher Timothy. And he's not slack or forgetful concerning his promise, as some men are, as some men count slackness, but he's long-suffering, that is, exceedingly patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But he doesn't force himself on anyone. He never has, he never will. And if we reject his offer of pardon through his son, this doctrine will provide no comfort in eternity because it is a false doctrine. Mormon theology, and I realize that they have a wonderful, a wonderful uh, program of putting themselves forth as a religion for God and family, but they're not close to what the scriptures say on so many issues, including this one. Mormon theology says we all began as the offspring of a mother God and father God in heaven. That's our first life. Our second life is here in this realm as we are today. And then our third life is in a four-tiered heaven. And how we fare here determines how we will fare on the other side. I ask you, where do you find that in this book? And the answer is, you don't. I have no doubt that many Mormons are wonderful people. They certainly have a reputation for being family-oriented and morally upright. But their concept of God, the place of Christ, and even eternity 
is without any kind of biblical foundation. Which leads us to ask, what is the biblical view? And there is one, and it's pretty simple. The biblical view is this. There is, beyond this realm, a very real place called heaven and a very real place called hell, and though I cannot locate them on a map for you, it doesn't make them any less real. You see, the Bible tells us that we are dual creatures. Made in the image of God, we have a physical body and a spiritual nature. Our physical body was made from dust. Our spirit comes from God. It is a part of him, so to speak. The fate of the body is clear. By divine design, it returns to dust. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. I've seen that and heard that so many times on television shows and in movies because whenever they depict a funeral and a graveside, almost always, <laughs> that expression comes up. And it's accurate. For our physical bodies, that is our ultimate fate. And it doesn't matter whether we're buried or burned. The end result is the same. But we're talking there about our physical body. What about that part of us made in the image of God? The fate of the Spirit is up to us. Jesus said, Marvel not at this, the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good in the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. Life and damnation, heaven and hell. Though the body is designed to return to corruption, to dust, our spirit may soar to be in the presence of God eternally. But there are certain things that are necessary to ensure that. And this is, my friend, completely consistent with the God that we read about in Scripture. The one referenced by Paul in Romans 11, 22, when he said, Behold, therefore the goodness and the severity of God. And then he went on to describe those who enjoyed God's goodness and those who faced his severity. And the determination was not made by God, folks. It was made by those people and the choices they made in respect to him and to his will. And that's true of us as well. Whether we share in God's goodness or God's severity, eternally is entirely in our hands. Now let's just very quickly parse the text that introduced our study this morning. If we sin willfully, after that we received a knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. What is a willful sin? It is a deliberate act in contradiction to the known will of God. It is knowing the truth which sets us free, John 8, 32, and choosing to disregard it and do our own thing or go our own way in spite of the fact that we know we shouldn't. This is not an act in a moment of weakness. This is not something that occurs when we don't think. Have you not spoken without thinking? I realize in the strictest sense that's impossible because our words originate in our minds. But sometimes we don't let them stay up there long enough to really understand and comprehend what is about to come out. I know, and God knows, that that can happen to all of us. It's not those kinds of things that are described here. These are the intentional, willful, deliberate acts of rebellion that occur when we know what God in his book demands and choose to disregard it. When we live our lives that way, this writer says there really isn't any other hope for us. There's nothing left to trust in. There's no one else to be our Savior. Jesus is it, God's only begotten Son. One and only one gave his life for us. There are no other saviors out there. So if we willfully reject him, 
and chart our own course, there's nothing left for us. There's no hope. He is it, the only one. His sacrifice, his blood, and nothing else can take away our sins. So the writer goes on to say, those who willfully sin can expect certain damnation. Not a word that we like to use because it expresses an idea that none of us could ever relish. To be lost, damned, separated from God for eternity is indescribably horrific. It is not possible to really grasp what it means to be lost eternally. Who are we talking about? And what does it entail? There really is uppermost, or ought to be in our minds. There's a certain fearful looking for of judgment and indignation. We've sung about that already this morning, Tim. Excellent songs. If we deliberately turn our back on God, and that's what you're doing if you know the truth and haven't obeyed it, or if you've obeyed the truth and have chosen not to live by it, you're in willful rebellion to the will of God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and the only thing in your future is a certain fearful looking for of condemnation, fiery indignation. And to prove the validity of the argument, the author says, you know the law of Moses. Under that law, at the mouth of two or more witnesses, certain punishment came. Now, if that is true under the law, how much more true, or how much more true, must that be true in regard to us? So those who reject Jesus are subject to even more severe punishment than those who sinned under the law. Why? Because they have trampled underfoot the Son of God afresh. And the language is really pretty vivid. Imagine the body of our Lord laid out before you on the floor and people are literally jumping up and down. We don't even do animals that are hit on the road that way. I've seen many people, myself included, have seen an animal struck on the road and we deliberately avoid running over it again. It's dead, it's just a carcass, but we show respect to it. Can you imagine people jumping up on, down on the body? Well, of course you say, never. But this writer says when we reject him, that's the essence of what we're doing. We're further treating the blood of the covenant wherewith we're sanctified an unholy thing. We're saying, Lord, we know you shed your blood to give us life, but we don't care. It doesn't matter. It has no real value. That which and that only which could provide redemption and salvation, we see as worthless without any merit or value. And then we do despite or insult the spirit of grace. How can we expect anything other than condemnation when that is our action in this life? And if you're wondering, this is the right and the responsibility of a spurned God. He made us. He is creator. We are creature. How can we obviously knowing the relationship, argue that this is not right. In the same text, we learn that our God is to be feared. We know from other passages that we are to have a profound respect for him. That's the good kind of fear that all of us ought to be exhibiting in a setting like this as we come to worship him and acknowledge our devotion, our submission, our desire to do His bidding. But if we rebel and deliberately turn our backs on Him, there's another kind of fear that comes into play, the fear of facing the wrath of God in the day of judgment and the consequences of our willful sin for eternity. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I know God is love. But I also know when we spurn that love and deliberately rebel against his authority, we will 
incur his wrath, as those in the days of Noah did, as those in the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah did, as Israel, the northern kingdom, did, and ultimately Judah, as all men eventually will. We will face the judgment of a just and merciful God who will honor our choices, and if we have lived in willful rebellion to him, it is a fearful thing to face him in judgment. Our God is a consuming fire. Oh yes, he's a God of love, but he's a just God who not only rewards the penitent, the believing, the faithful, but will honor the choices of those on the other side with eternal torment. Some will say, well, that just doesn't seem fair. How could God punish someone for eternity for a few years of failure to honor and obey him here? Well, let me ask you a second question. Why in the world would God reward the faithful with heaven for a few years of faithfulness here? If one is illogical and unacceptable, the other must also be as well. The fact of the matter is, God has made clear what lies ahead. And if you're not ready, you ought to be afraid. You don't need to be afraid of men. But you do need to be afraid of God. That's what Jesus said. He said, don't be afraid of what men may do to you, what they can do to your body. But fear him who is able to cast your soul into hell. And when you have the right kind of fear, that will lead to proper response to his call. So, the scriptures tell us that certain doom awaits the following. Where do you find yourself in relation to these things? If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema, accursed. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 22. When we do not love God and do not love Christ we will face certain doom eternally. And if you're wondering, well, I love the Lord, I love God, answer this question for me. Have you obeyed them? That will demonstrate the genuineness or validity of your love or will be a testament to the lack of it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, I understand, as you do, that none of us perfectly comply with every demand of the maker. We are weak, we are flawed, we sin, and if we say we have no sin, we are liars, and the truth is not in us. But we can be faithful to him. We can seek every day to obey him. We can live our lives so that others see a reflection of him in our life and know that we belong to him. But the opposite is also true. We can live in such a way that our words are negated by our actions. And the fact that we don't obey him demonstrates a lack of genuine love and therefore the certainty of condemnation and judgment. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, the Apostle Paul, who is an inspired author and therefore speaks not for himself but for his Lord, for our God, reminded his readers that the Son will come with his angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, that leads to this passage where he talks about those who do not love the truth being damned. Chapter 1, and we're going to get to that in a moment, tells us that he's coming. And he's coming to reap vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel. Well, who are those folks? Those who do not have a love of the truth, but have believed a lie. And because they believed a lie, they stand condemned. They have not put their trust in the master. And thus are damned because they believe a lie. A strong delusion in some translations. That's why it's so necessary that everything you hear, you examine in light of what this book reveals to make sure that the message is faithful and true to God. Now, does God want you to be lost? Absolutely not. How do you know that? He sent his son who gave his life for you. 
But if you won't accept the gospel, if you embrace other things, strong delusions or lies, if you please, there's no hope. Is that hard to understand? Not at all. Then the passage that I quoted speaks of those who do not obey the gospel, those who do not know God. Obedience is not a bad four-letter word. Now, many of our religious friends would have us believe that it is. They argue that faith and faith alone is all that stands between any of us and eternity. But faith not expressed in obedience is not living faith. And it's living faith that saves, not the dead faith that James talks about in chapter 2. Our faith to be alive does more than acknowledge the sonship of Jesus. When it's real and genuine, it, it turns our life around. It makes us better people. It helps us in our weaknesses to know the direction our life should take and the way we respond to problems and how we treat each other. And that obedience to the gospel is not a minor thing at all. It's absolutely essential. We can talk about faith all we want, but if we don't demonstrate it, it is not real or genuine and will not save. In Galatians 1, Paul said, if any man essentially teach anything other than this gospel, he'll be accursed. Though I or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which I preach to you, let him be accursed. The principle of heaven and hell, salvation, damnation, is not difficult to comprehend, nor is it hard to figure out where we are in relationship to eternity. The problem, and I, I'm, I'm being as serious as I possibly can now, the problem is we want to think about these things in terms of everybody but ourselves. We can see the faults and failings of the people around us, but sadly never see our own. I don't want to know today whether you love the Lord or not nearly as much as I want to know that I love the Lord because the only life I have any real control over is my own. Do I truly love him? And the answer is found in my obedience to him. The same is true for you. Do I believe the truth or have I put my trust in a lie? This is where you go to find out. Are you building your life on the principles of this book or are you following the Book of Mormon? The publications of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society? The writings of Mary Baker Eddy? And again, I'm not casting, casting dispersions on any individual or group of people. They're wonderful, fine, upright people in all of these denominations. But do you read about them in this book? Or have those folks believed a strong delusion? And if so, what is their ultimate fate? What about me? Have I obeyed the gospel? Do I really know God? And you know God, ladies and gentlemen, by knowing his son. Jesus said that in John 14. And if you know God and you know the son, then obedience ought to be the most natural thing in the world. Oh, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Well, has that faith changed your life? That's what repentance is all about. And Jesus said, without it, you cannot be saved. Without it, you will perish, Luke 13, 3 and 5. You say, oh, yes, Roger, I, I, I am a different person because I believe in Jesus. My life has changed. But did Jesus demand more? He said... Confess me before men, and I will confess you before the Father. Deny me before men, and I'll deny you before the Father. Where do you stand in that regard? Have you made the initial confession? Do you make that confession every day, or do you shy away from opportunities to speak out in behalf of the Master? 
And what about immersion? Oh, you can't tell me the little water stands between me and eternity. I don't tell you that. That's what the book says. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. And again, the passage does not imply nor do we teach that water washes away sin. We believe that nothing but the blood of Jesus can do that. But at what point? You know, if you've got dirty clothes, you can fill the washer with water, and you can dump the soap, the laundry detergent inside, but if you don't get the clothes in there, they're not going to get washed, are they? We know the power of the blood of Christ, and we know that water is where we contact that power. We don't get in it. How can we expect to have the inner man cleansed by the blood of Jesus? Well, you truly believe you will obey and if you don't obey, there's just a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. You see, what lies ahead is up to us and no one else. Heaven or hell, after death, we make that choice in this life. God has done everything he could possibly do, folks. Hear me. What more could he give than he's given? What more can he do than he's done? How can he say, I love you, any stronger with any greater force than he said when he gave his unspeakable gift? It would not be possible. His love, mercy, and grace provide a way. Not ways, but a way through him. John 14, 6. So when we close and leave this building today, we will determine, will we walk in that way? Will we follow in the steps of the Master? Will heaven be our future? Or will we deliberately, willfully sin? There be no more sacrifice for sin. No hope, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. And it's up to you. You make that determination this very moment by your response to Jesus and his invitation as together we stand and sing. Hear ye now the invitation, oh, prepare to meet thy God. Carest all in the warning, for your life was in me gone. Oh, outside to face the judgment, I'm Condition 
Closing song will be number 349. Thank you, Roger, for that message this morning. Also, thank you to everyone who took an active part in our worship service this morning and with our Bible classes. Janet Thompson, Karen Thompson's mother, is now at home. Helen Nolan is still in memorial, and she passed along this note that uh, she and Junior asked that I read. It says, to all my Christian family, thanks for the cards that has been coming my way. Thanks for all the prayers and keep them coming. Room 404, bed one, Marietta Memorial. God bless you all, love you all, Helen Nolan. Brenda Miller is at Heartland and is currently undergoing chemotherapy treatments with surgery planned in four to five weeks. No visitors at this time, but cards are appreciated. We extend our deepest sympathy to the family of L. Jean Fryman, Gertie's sister-in-law. A memorial service was held on Tuesday. There's a meeting today in the front of the auditorium following the evening service for all of those willing to help with the VBS Kids Day. If you have any questions, see Tom Eddy. Roger mentioned the two sign-up sheets, one for the ladies' tea Saturday at 2 p.m. and one for the family and friends' potluck following the morning service next Sunday. Remember our midweek Bible study at 7 p.m. on Wednesday and also our Sunday morning Bible study at 9 a.m. next Sunday morning. Following one final song, Randy Feisley will lead our minds in a closing prayer. Number 349, 349, we'll sing verses 2 and 3. If you're able to, please stand. <clears throat> Father, we come to you at this time thanking you for the glorious day you've given us. We thank you, for, Father, for the opportunity you've given us to freely come here and sing songs of praise and study from your word. 
And we thank you, Father, especially for Roger and the ability you've given us to deliver such powerful lessons. We ask you, Father, to be with us and help us to study the doctrines of other people that, and, and then go back to your word and, and your book and, and live our lives according to thy word that in a positive, creative way that we can lead others to thee through that word. We ask you, Father, to be with those that are sick and afflicted and struggling, and we ask you, Father, to be with their caretakers and those around them to encourage them and help them and keep them positive and bring them back, be with us, if it be, be thy will. Especially, Father, be with those that's lost loved ones, because in the trying time, only you can comfort them and help them to look to you for comfort as only you can give. Father, as we're about to go to our separate places of abode, we ask you to forgive us, forgive us as we've sinned and, and guide us in our lives that we can, ex, we can exude some positive to everybody around us. And if it be thy will, bring us back at the next appointed time. In Christ's name, we pray you to forgive